all nervous about the whole thing because I don't even know oh. what I'm saying. Well, I don't either. Let's just, you know. Well, I'm recording now already, so good. <laughs> I'll, I'll start my timer. So I have a timer anyway. Next to me. <laughs> I'm just going to take cues from you guys. I'm not going to set a timer because that is I really. I can't. It's really no. stressful. That's yeah. fine. Then don't. It's I'll, not stressful. I'll, I'll do you guys in if needed. If I start hey, yeah. doing this, it means wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> but I need to be able to see Willie then because <laughs> my camera's in front of her. I can't let it be. Okay. So are we good to go? Yeah. Hello and so welcome to the. <laughs> Thank See, you. it's already happened. <laughs> I love right. it. We should have just had signboards that said who we are, and then you put it down. And um, take two. I, yeah. <laughs> so, Jessica can't stop laughing now. That I can never happen. stop laughing. That is. We're bad. all gonna start laughing. <laughs> well, that kind of shows who we are, though. Yeah. You know. Okay. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the Kinder uh, Roundtable Discussion, part of the Phys Ed Summit 2020 sponsored by Phys Edagogy. We are here to kind of gather the minds of teachers that truly love teaching kindergarten and kind of some tips of the trade and things you need to know about them to make you successful in that practice. So my name is Jessica Monlux. I have been teaching for about 12 years now. I'm in Northern California. My school is TK through sixth grade, about 500 students. I get to see my kindergartners twice a week for 30 minutes. Two days a week, they are with paraprofessionals. And I am only outside unless it's raining. I've got a, the, um, my outdoor space is their playground. And 20 feet away is the upper grade recesses at the same time. So that's kind of my setup. And I have one kindergarten class at a time, which I'm pretty lucky for. So, Willie, what's your setup? Well, my name is Willie Wilson. Um, I had the pleasure of teaching for 34 years, just newly retired as of last June. And I taught uh, for those years, kindergarten through sixth grade. I saw my students one to two times a week and um, only one class at a time, which was great. I taught both inside and outside. And within the last decade, really started insisting that I could have my kindergartners in the multi-purpose room. Uh, so that we had that enclosed environment. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I teach in Sacramento, California. <laughs> Hi, I'm Barb Borden. Um, I teach K2 in Frankfurt, Illinois. We have about 800 students. We do have PE every day for 30 minutes. Uh, we have two gyms in our school, so we're lucky we have a lot of space, but we are inside um, most of the year because being in Illinois, um, when it's nice out, we try and get outside. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much my setup. Kelly. I'm Kelly Brown, and I teach pre-K through second grade in the state of Georgia. We teach our kids twice every six days. I have two or three classes at a time, so anywhere from 40 to 75 kindergartners in a gym the size of probably a half court basketball setup. So there's a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. So the way this is gonna work is we're gonna kinda pinpoint things of what makes a kindergartner a kindergartner, and then kinda go through and how that affects our teaching and things you need to keep in mind. So the number one thing we came across to keep in mind is that kindergartners are about 60 months old. That's it, they're 60 months old usually when we get them. So what does that mean for our teaching, you guys? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's all about, you know, showing them love and respect and being really flexible. Um, you got to be able to kind of roll with the punches because, you know, they're, they're again, just like you said, 60 months old. That is, you know, I have shoes that are older than them. So you got to kind of be on your toes, but you got to kind of be really nurturing and loving and treat them like your own. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. You have to be an entertainer. You yeah. have to be, you have to make them look at you. So you better have something to show. <laughs> yeah. And so you, what do you guys think? Constantly about? throwing your curveballs. You gotta, yeah. Go no, I was just going to say, you, you be on your toes and and when I said being flexible it's just kind of 
you know, being ready with something in your back pocket if something doesn't go right, because nine out of 10, nine out of 10 times, you know, it's not going to go the way you planned. No. <laughs> no. Roll no. no. <laughs> not with kinders. No. no. Yeah. So what about space wise? Um, so our space is not very big, but we have a lot of students. So I, there needs to be a lot of structure and procedures and routine. The kinders really thrive when they know what's coming next and how the room operates. Mm -hmm. That means it's time saving for us. So we have seating areas. We have, um, ways that we line up with our home base spots we line up in number order so they're learning math on top of you know learning how to be close to someone without touching them um we our transitions are always done the same way so that they know what to expect when they hear a certain sound you know whatever those sounds are you can use music you can use a whistle you can use a chime or a drum as long as they know what that sound means, you're going to get that response. Mm -hmm. So those routines make a huge difference is, but you have to preach those from day one and you have to understand that you have to teach them everything. Assume nothing. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> For sure. So I think Hi. we have some photos of your setup to share. So I'm going to pull that up real quick. So want to talk about that There's photo right there, Those are the, the top left picture is my home base numbers. Every student gets a number, and that's their number to sit on for the whole year. Um, the black lines that are on the <laughs> next picture to the right are what we call the sidewalks. And the sidewalks are how you get from one, how you get from one area of the gym to another. So we always walk on the sidewalk. We don't walk through other people's games because then you're gonna be walking in the middle of jump ropes. Mm -hmm. So when we are lined up in our different activities, we use stations and so I have colored dots on the floor. There's for them to match with their colored wristbands. And there's some other pictures of the sidewalks and a full picture of the gym. So you can take some of those pictures and try to see if what can work for you in your gym. And then what about um, procedures when it comes to actual saving time for ourselves? Like I know you have some great ones in here. Want to talk about that? Um, so, so this is a big one here is people with it when they come in with lunch boxes or coats or <laughs> birthday cake rings or whatever you come in with. We, we have some cubbies that we adopted and they just shove their stuff in there. I don't number them or anything, but they, I'm eyeballing the cubbies at the end of class. If they're all empty, everybody got everything. Now I do have uh, some hippos that I made because we did a theme of board games this year. And so this is our hungry hippo and he's made out of a kitty litter box but he is going to swallow the coats that get left in there. You have till the end of the day, but if you come back the next time, you may see a sleeve hanging out. And <laughs> believe me, they don't leave their coats. I mean, kinders look at that and are like, oh my God, whose sweater is that? You know, so, you know, and the year before we did a monster theme. So what the other picture has a picture of a box with a hole in it and a monster's mouth. Mm -hmm. Well, each time a coat got swallowed up, they would come back in the next week and it was a bigger box. <laughs> I love that. And so they were like, oh my gosh, how many coats has he eaten? Don't <laughs> leave your coat. He's going to grow. So it's any of these things that I don't have to, I don't have to be a coat Nazi and say, hey, get your coats. And that. I don't want to do that they go at the end of class to go to their home base numbers and they go straight to the cubbies and get it. If they don't, they'll see it in the, in the hippo. Mm -hmm. Believe me, they'll get it the next time. It, it's not going down the road. <laughs> Sounds rather harsh, but they actually, I, they look at that hippo every time they come in. 
It would be very good to kind of step on that one. It does. It does. Well, and if you don't have access to a hippo, as, as long as you have that set yes. place where they put their items yes. on their way out, they can see it, locate it, pick it up and go, right? Right. And you can yeah. walk past it and point to it. I mean, I'm sure we all have kinders that look at a coat that's theirs and go, that's not mine. Oh, yeah. They really wore can. it in there. <laughs> For sure. So... <laughs> Another major thing to keep in mind about kinders is that they are completely egocentric. Developmentally, that's where they're at. Their world is them, and that's it. They don't have a sense yet of how they interact with the world yet, or that there's really other people involved in the world and how they can affect others. They're just at that transition stage where they're starting to learn that kind of stuff. So when we're, when we're teaching kinders, it's super important for us to keep in mind that we are teaching that child in not just the content of it. They don't know how to be students yet. So we have to keep in mind that we're teaching each individual child. It, it, that comes down to like, yes, they're all about 60 months old, but if they are the oldest child and have a younger sibling, that 60 months is gonna look really different as if they're the baby and have five older siblings, right? Yeah, they're the only absolutely. child, it's gonna look really different. If they come from, a family that is super supportive and nurturing, that's gonna come across really different in class than if they're coming from a household where they don't have that same kind of loving support. Yes. And so right. all of that comes in with, um, with teaching that child. So I know uh, Barb does this as well, but I do a daily check-in with all my students and I teach them in kindergarten what that means. So for me, I have colored faces on the ground for them to walk across. And so it's either red, meaning like they're really not ready to learn today. Yellow, they're okay. And green's like, they're good. They're ready to observe. They're, they're ready to learn. And so they walk across every single day of the beginning class. And when we leave, they walk back across. That way I know coming into class, what they're, if they're ready or not, if they're not ready, my lesson's going to change. It goes back to what Barb was saying before about having to be flexible and all that kind of stuff. You have to teach that student that day. That student that day is probably going to be different than the next day even. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it yeah. comes across as a pretty <laughs> does. It's a job, especially at that age when they don't know how to change yet to adapt to situations. It's our job to do that adapting to teach them how to do that. Well, that implementing those zones, I, I use the zones of regulation similar <laughs> App on the way in we have the signs on the door and it really does help you kind of adjust your lesson because you might have a kid and you're like well, you know what happened you don't know maybe their pet died and that's going to change the way you you might teach them that day you know for sure being flexible that's, that's also, right because that's their world you know and it is going back to just being egocentric and they think about themselves so it's good to know how they're feeling and you can kind of, you know, gauge your lesson according to that, you mm -hmm. know? And, and when you have a classroom full of those kids that are like, I have a class that's full of, it's, you know, 90% of them are only children or youngest children. That makeup of the class is going to make it different and how you would approach those <laughs> Yeah. 60 months olds that are, you know, you've got 75 kids or I've got 40 of those, but you know, almost all of them are babies of the family. Yeah. There, there's, that's, that's a whole one. different thing. <laughs> that's a whole different thing. It is. It is. So what about keeping that in mind then for partners and social skills staff? Yeah, I typically uh, don't let the kids pick partners. Definitely not in the beginning of the year. I, yeah. um, you know, like there's a lot of great apps out there. There's like uh, the the shake, the dice shake, and or team shake. Team shake. And I personally use Class Dojo, which I really like a lot to um, get the kids and partners. And it. it's got great um, toolbox on there that you can. can choose where if you don't want a certain kid in the group you can kind of take care of it for you um but i also have have the kids watch a video um sarah wood came up with these awesome partner levels 
you know, level two, three, and four, where it kind of really teaches the kids like what they look like when they're paired with somebody. And so I show this video to them and it really kind of sinks in with like, oh yeah, I don't want to act like that when I get paired up with a certain person. So uh, mm -hmm. they really like it. And I don't know if you want to go ahead and- Yeah, let's pull this up here. Yeah, so definitely um, it hits home. <laughs> They can identify with these characters. For sure. And you know you have that kid on the ground. <laughs> Routinely. <laughs> you do. Yeah. As soon as you put him with a person. Not true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those are the faces we see. I know. Every time. Yeah. yeah. You have that student that does that too to try to like, no, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we really stress like, hey, let's try level three or level four, you know, let's take a look. And, <clears throat> and they really do try mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. it, and they, they start practicing it. Yes. Yeah. And the practice is key. Yeah. And it spreads like wildfire. It totally does. It does. They like to be able to say, I was a number three. I was a level four. Well, it feels good, right? It feels good to encourage others. Well, and how does it make you feel as the other person when your partner reacts that way? Like, look at how excited they are to be my partner. Wow. It really yeah. Yeah. Yes, you know? that makes a huge difference. Yeah, but it could really tear them down too if you act like level one or two, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we, we go over this and we really um, yes. press it a lot. So. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's a good little That's tool. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm a fan of that. I'm definitely going to be using that one, I got to say, because <laughs> I mean, it's, I am too. It's, it's shown in a way that really, like we talked about before, like being an entertainer, like your job is to grab their attention. They don't know how to pay attention to a teacher yet, except yeah. us to help them do that. And this is a fantastic way of doing that. Yeah. And it's, if I had just said, hey, this is level one, level two student. No, no. Explained it. I, you got to act it out just like. Kelly was saying, you know, you're an entertainer. You either act, mm -hmm. you get crazy, you wear a costume, you do yes. to yeah. kind of, and that's why that video. Came and up. my para and I, you know, if some teachers don't have a bit a projector in their room, I know that that yeah. right. it's hard to get one. So my para and I, we acted out what you just saw in that video. That's <laughs> us. Yeah. I'm, she, I she tells me no and I get on the floor and cry yeah. and mm -hmm. they are like that wasn't very <laughs> nice and, uh -huh. yeah you can't say no to her that hurts her feelings right. and they are able to share what because th th I'm like wh they're like why is she crying right. and they share what why I'm crying you know yeah. and that helps that them to explain that because then they actually see it happening. They're really shocked when an, when their teachers are doing it, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So another major point is um, kindergartners are made to learn. That They're at that age, their brains are actually made to be soaking up this information. They have to learn by doing, they're curious. They need so much of the actual doing to be able to comprehend anything. So what does that look like in our classrooms then? Well, the doing part is what seems to give everybody the hardest time because that's what we want is them to do. Right. But you've got to set the scene before they can start doing. That means you need to, if you need to color code everything so that they understand how to get from one place to another, I use colored wristbands to to help them find 
stations and the stations are coded. They're all with their team. Nobody's wandering off. You know, I use the music and it's, you know, and I think there's a video that I was able to save that you can watch on there that says, you know, that shows them at their stations working with each other. But e even some of my stations, they're working by themselves. It depends on mm -hmm. where they are. But the engaging equipment to allow for their creativity will help keep them engaged. Yes. You know, I have a dance unit where it's a creative dance and I have a dress up box that they can wear necklaces and costumes. And then I set up a blank video camera and a TV and they think they're making YouTube videos, but yeah. by heavens, they are dressed up and ready to go. It takes longer for them to dress up. But oh, yeah. we have to remember those are things that, that engage them that they're not getting anymore these days. They're Correct. not getting that dress up and home living and those type of activities. And the minute mm -hmm. they see that stuff, they, I mean, you get a dollar store diamond ring and they're like wearing it, you know, and then I dress myself yeah. up in it and they're like, oh, I hope I get to that station. You know, yeah. all of a sudden you've had buy-in 100%. You know, mm -hmm. and that's part, that's part of getting, you know, your engaging environment. That's how you're going to get them and you're going to have their attention a hundred percent. So here, I know you shared a quick picture of you doing this, which is uh, yeah, that's... fantastic. <laughs> Kelly in her prime doing I her do. Thing. I do dress up. I, I love it. I'm just five years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and it, that's the kind of thing that's going to be that attention grabber. Get them really yeah, engaged in it. It is. The other thing to keep in mind with this is the fact that they're so eager to learn is that to make use of every single second you have with them. Yes. So for me, I pick up my students from the classroom. I have to walk out to where our class is held and walking back. So I make use of all of those transition times. Every time we're walking to from, because that's part of my minutes, is we do um, crisscross walks. So it's when they walk, crossing their feet over the line, so they're forced to be crossing that midline, which is so important to get their actual corpus callosum, like actually talking to each other and get the two hemispheres of their brain connected. And I make use of that. So they know every time that hallway, they're not allowed to walk normal. They cannot touch the line. Their feet must go on opposite sides mm -hmm. of the line. And I started that in kindergarten. So then my first graders, when they start school, they're doing like their teachers, like, what are you doing? They're like, we're doing a cross, crisscross walk. And they're like, they knew, the new first grade teachers are always a little bit like, what are my students doing? Like twilight yeah. zone. Cause they don't know. I, even with their classroom teachers now, any transition time for walking down the hallway, every single student is doing their crisscross walk. So I've now mm -hmm. taken it beyond just my class when I have them. Right. I'm now bringing in that brain development every time they're walking anywhere on campus. And like, that's the maximum use of time, right? You need yeah. to make use of that. Yeah, you, you do. don't get them for very long, not nearly as long as I think they need from us, but it's, it's really important to make sure that like those downtimes, and we all know like how kindergartners are, like having to go to the bathroom is completely contagious. Yes. Oh my gosh. And so, <laughs> like, it is. So, one thing that I've done on those days where, like, you think everyone's already gone and then forget it, the whole class has to go. I literally walk my students there. They're in a line facing me, backs facing the bathroom. I'm dismissing them. Everyone else is in line, and we're doing a game what, that I call Mon Luck Says. So, Simon says it's Mon Luck Says because mm -hmm. I'm the most important person. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and during that time, like, they're not allowed to talk because we're literally right between, like, we're right next to the sixth grade classroom, right next to a fourth grade classroom. Like, we, it's hard to have a whole kindergarten class there, but they know they cannot make a sound. And all mm -hmm. they can do is copy what I'm doing with my body. So that's when I'm working on the balancing skills. That's when I'm working on, like, the stationary crossing the midline stuff. And so I know my, my class, my normal lesson plan is completely shot at that point. If I'm going to have every single kid needing to go to the bathroom, we're going to turn yeah. class into yeah. going to the bathroom and to go into the bathroom. make use of that time. Um, like it goes back to everything Barbara said about, you know, being the flexible kind of thing, like have those things in your back pocket of what to do if this happens. Um, like, you know, the bathroom thing happens a lot, no yeah. matter how many times you say, make sure you've gone to the bathroom first. Like they, they can't again, they're, they're yeah. 60 months old. One kid says they got to go and your yeah. whole class is going to have to go. That's all there is to it. So nip it in the bud, get them all done, 
and then salvage what you can of your life right. is kind of what I've made use of. That's doing. right. Yeah. So the other part of this stuff is that, have you guys ever had them, like you think you give really clear directions oh, yeah. and like they take everything so literally, oh. like, like run around the cone and they run around the cone instead of the cones. The cones. Yes. yes. <laughs> I've had that happen so many times. Yeah. 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 And you yeah, have you to definitely... use the, cor the correct words because we're yeah. not allowed to run in our gym. It's too small. So I have to catch myself. You, you better jog and you need to know the difference mm -hmm. because they're like, are we going to run today? I'm like, have, do we ever run in here? Where do we run? Oh, we run outside, you know, but that's unique to my situation, but I have to remember the language that I'm using with them Yeah, because it has to fit my room. Mm -hmm. and they're very literal. Yeah. They are it's literal. <laughs> Yeah, you really have to model what you want them to do. And sometimes like, they will understand that. I mean, it's an easy, you know, direction. And then you didn't demonstrate and holy oh, get it. They're all over. You're like, nah. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it's OK to regroup, too, sometimes and have oh, absolutely. and reteach it because, you know, otherwise then it's chaos. Right. Yeah. And I think some people feel like it's not that they don't feel like it's right that they have to stop the whole class. I've stopped the whole class many times. Do over. Let me re say this. Mm -hmm. Let me re show you because if 80% of you are doing something different than what I said, that's a yes. teacher problem. Mm -hmm. You know, no, exactly. from, and, but that doesn't mean that just because I, it was my problem that they don't still need to know what to do. I need to reteach. Right. And they don't care. They, they don't know the script behind the whole thing. They just right. hear me say, everybody freeze, everybody sit down, listening body, listening eyes. And let's look at this again. What do you see me doing? You know, exactly. make sure they're all looking. Cause half the time what happened is they lost you, <laughs> you know, or you lost them. <laughs> well, that goes into the whole thing about making them actual learners, making them students, right? That's right. part of our job is they don't know they don't know that yet. So with right. our clear, concise directions, that helps. But then we also have to make sure that we're teaching them to be independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, it always helps yeah. to have a gradual release too, right? So you have yeah. the demonstration. You have one or two go and demonstrate. Yes. And a couple more, and then you ask the rest of the class, "What do you see them doing?" Yes. Right. Understanding as they release. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And it also helps to model you as a, as the teacher model yourself, messing it up. Yeah. They, believe they me, love they will it. catch you. Yeah. No, you're not supposed to throw the bowling ball, you know, cause I'll th stand there. I'm like, how do you bowl? And I'll put my arm up. They're like, no, you can't throw the bowling ball. Yeah. I'm like, you know, if you throw a bowling ball in a bowling alley, they take your bowling shoes and send you home. <laughs> you know, what that's about, what, that's for real. Yeah. So what about, um, what kind of procedures do you guys have in your classes to make them actual independent learners then? So you don't have to hold their hands. When something comes up, what kind of stuff do they already have procedures for that you no longer have to worry about? Well, and for me, we have, we have set up in the gym stations for things that they can take care of on their own. And we talk about that, you know, if you get hurt and it's minor, you know, and they know what the difference, if it's pouring blood, they're probably not getting up, but you know, <laughs> I, I, most of the time it's, I, I have hurt. Do you need a band aid? So I'm going to show these pictures. You know here, where it is, what you this, have. Yeah. We these have our first aid station. This is our hospital area. And if you notice, I have a refrigerator, there's a freezer. I have ice packs in there that are in Ziploc bags. There's little drawers with Band-Aids, hand sanitizer, Kleenex. Um, if we go outside, then I have a cooler that I fill with ice and Ziploc bags go with us uh, in a backpack. Um, mm -hmm. One the other picture, there he is in the hospital chair with his ice pack that he chose. I find some fun ice packs because, you know, sometimes they're going to find the rainbow poop and they want to use that. Or they're going to take the diamond ring ice pack. You know, these are 
just a couple of different set up where my first aid station is, but mom and dad let you put your own Band-Aid on. Yeah. It is huge. If you, do you need an ice pack? You know where they are. So yeah. I've just given them that little bit of independence and all of a sudden you see their shoulders go back. Mm-hmm. But how long do they sit there? Well, they sit there as long as you don't feel well. Yeah. Most of, most of my kids do not want to sit there longer than a minute or two, which is what that injury probably needed. You so know, what it, about, but because they're such, they have so few prior experiences, what is it really important for us to make sure that we're getting across them, that we're actually teaching them? You mean like in terms of skill? Yeah. Well, I like to refer to uh, George Graham's uh, movement analysis framework. And um, I don't know if you want to put that up. Yeah, I can get that up there. Um, So we know in kindergarten, um, students uh, have to learn the alphabet, right? And then they learn how to put words together. Once they put words together, then they start to learn how to form sentences. And as they get older, sentences become paragraphs. Paragraphs become letters or essays and then you know uh reports that sort of thing so we have our own movement alphabet which essentially is what this wheel is and so on the outside of the wheel um we have the movement concept so instead of having 26 uh letters we have two major areas we have movement concepts and we have motor skills and the outside of the wheel um, are those movement concepts and these are essentially adverbs How are the adverbs? Well, the center of the wheel are the motor skills, the action words, the kicking, striking, catching, the galloping, leaping, and your non-locomotor movements. And the movement um, concepts affect those verbs. So the adverbs, you know, how do you kick? Today we're gonna be kicking, but let's kick it hard, kick it soft. Uh, Let's see if you can kick the ball high. Uh, let's see if you can kick it with a light force. Uh, and so the wheel, the center part of the wheel, um, if you take this diagram and are able to put a little pin in it, you can spin the wheel so that that center section turns. And so those uh, movement concepts can be applied to the motor skills. So when you're teaching kindergarten, it's important to teach first, how does my body work? How can I control my body in space? What kind of shapes can, can I make? How can I make it go fast, make it go slow? How can I take my body and move it in relationship to myself, move it in relationship to others, move it in relationship to um, other objects or equipment? And then the effort qualities, time, force, flow. How can I allow my body to experience those concepts? And then you add in the equipment, and then you add in the motor skills. And, um, and that's the beauty because it's like of learning how to read. You take those simple pieces and you um, pre- become proficient in those little ABCs. And then you begin to combine them. Uh, running is not just running by itself, but now it becomes running and jumping and uh, striking hard or taking a scarf and moving it slow and fast. And that movement vo- vocabulary then establishes the foundation that as they get older, they begin to um, allow themselves to become physically literate. If our kinders don't learn these basic foundational skills, when they go out to recess and someone wants to play catch with them and they don't feel good about themselves catching and they don't know how to catch or they, they feel embarrassed when they can't catch, then they're not going to do it. And so right. then you start to see kids withdraw from activity and then right. they're losing out on yeah, the activity totally. that we want them to be participating in. Right. So these, these yeah. foundational skills are really important. We don't want to waste our time with large group games or relays when the kids could be learning the, these basic elements to help them be successful. Mm-hmm. Right. And then what about like, um, I know Willie, you have a great thing to share about like how you get their attention to get them actually ready. So we do all this activity with them, but what about then how to get them to transition to like, okay, now I need to like actually focus and listen. Oh, you mean, are you talking about give me five? Okay. Well, there is a slide for give me five. Yeah. Let me pull that up here. So we, we want the students to know that it's important to learn physical education, right? 
physical education, PE, what does it mean? It means we're using our bodies to actively learn, okay? Stand in recess, recess is play, free play, we do whatever we want. But when we come into our classrooms, we want everyone the opportunity to learn. So we have five things that we need to be responsible for. You know, we need to be responsible for our ears that we listen. We need to be responsible for our eyes and looking at the speaker or whoever that might be. Maybe it's the student demonstrating or the teacher instructing. We need to make sure that our lips are quiet unless we've been called on or asked to do a pair of chair. Uh, we need to make sure that our hands are in the appropriate place, not on our neighbor or playing with the equipment. And then that our legs, you know, depending on when you've stopped them, they're either frozen in space or maybe sitting in crisscross, that those legs are not moving and kicking and that sort of thing. So, you know, all you have to say is, okay, freeze, give me five. You know, and, and when the kids know all five areas, then they are really focused, you know, mm -hmm. ready, ready to turn and learn. We don't want to have to make the kindergartners come in and out and in and out. Sometimes they're all spread out and we ask them to freeze. They should be able to learn from across the playground. Across the playground and across the field. Immediately exactly. turn your attention. And they can do that. They can. Yeah. But you have to teach it, which is oh. what you just showed. And you have to teach forth. that. And, and teach it and teach it and teach it. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. And some kids get it right off and others don't. And so you gently remind them, you know, what the five are and it, sometimes constant reminders. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you have to be okay with that. I mean, with kindergarten, oh. just go in knowing this, mm -hmm. that you're going to be teaching and reteaching multiple times because mm -hmm. that's when you start to get stressed out. You think there's something wrong with me as a teacher. No, there isn't. They're yeah. five years old. Yeah. Right. We have to remember too, that this is their first time learning. Exactly. And dealing time. with an, an adult that is not their parent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You figure this is also the first time they're ever expected really to do anything for this length of time. Right. Like they're little guys, their attention span is incredibly short. Their stamina is pretty low. Like they're not, you can't expect them to just go run laps or jog laps. Like they, no. their bodies can't right. do that. So I know one thing that um, we've talked about is like the different lengths and times of our classes. You can't ever ask a kindergartner to do one thing for 30 minutes. No, okay. no way. Especially in the beginning when they're such babies. Yeah. yeah. And I know some teachers have, have kinders for an hour. Yeah. Oh, you know, mm -hmm. I can't see. I have them for 45 minutes mm -hmm. and I feel like it's not enough time. Yeah. So, but yeah. that's because there's a lot of management that goes on during that 45 minutes. Completely. And their actual learning time, I want as much of it as I can, but it takes a lot of that management to be under control. Right. Yep. And other things we've already talked about are, you know, that they learn through the exploration and all that kind of stuff and the repetition and yeah. so how so much of this is we need to, you know, teach them as students of the age they are, right? They're not many adults yet at all, how they really just need time with the equipment and time doing everything in order to learn because that's how they are. Another main thing is that they are still very reactionary. Their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed yet. It's, right. it's not there. The way their brain is, they're still very much developing that part of their brain, which is why we talk about help, helping them become the independent learners, help them, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Um, one of those things is that they're reactionary. They have no coping skills. So, right. and, and they also... Uh, you know, you also can't assume that when they're off task, they're being naughty. Yes. You know, so, so if they're out doing exploratory activities with the ball and then you find them taking their ball and throwing it at another student, you know, you, maybe, it, maybe it was intentional or maybe not. You might need to come over and say, hey, what are we learning today? What's our purpose in this activity? Mm -hmm. And if they can tell you, great job. Now show me, can, can you toss and, you know, catch the ball 10 times? And then if you find that they're frustrated, and they really can't, then maybe that's an opportunity to differentiate and give them a different right. kind of object. Or maybe the skill is really too easy and they need to give, be given an extension. Oh, mm -hmm. I see you do that 10 times. Let's give you something harder. Yes. Or perhaps they go, uh, I don't know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, by the way, look, watch the student right next to you. This is what we're doing. Yeah. They, they're always yeah. naughty. Sometimes, you know, their misbehavior is an indication that the activity 
you mm -hmm. really appropriate or it's too hard. Yeah, that's yeah. right. The other major thing is that they don't have coping skills yet, right? So part of our responsibility is helping fill in that part for the, the coping skills and the problem solving stuff. What do you guys do about that? Um, well, we have a calm corner or a peace palace that they can go to, um, where if they're feeling out of control, I do not intentionally teach this because no. then they all want to go. Yeah. So, and I've, that's, uh, that's a learned thing. So if we just go ahead and tell you that up front, don't, you don't intentionally teach it. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes a teachable moment for those students that need right. it. Yes, um, absolutely because sometimes they just need to, you know, I don't stop the whole class when there's a tantrum. Mm -hmm. I, you know, class continues. My yep. music is louder than the tantrum child. <laughs> and I can go over and I can help you over and show you here's where you can calm down. You know, yeah. I have a beanbag chair. You, there's some, there's a rug over there with the different feelings on it. Maybe you can't tell me what you're, how you're feeling, but you can show me on the face. Mm -hmm. I also have a mirror you know, because you can come back when you're feeling better, but kinders don't know what they look like when they're angry. They don't know that what that face looks like. They, they only know how they're feeling and they can't explain it. Correct. So a mirror is huge. They look in that mirror and I'm like, is the sad face gone? And they look in the mirror. They don't know unless they look. I'm like, is it gone? And they'll smile looking in the mirror and they go, yeah, it is. Yeah. Or they'll, they'll snarl and no, it isn't, you know, <laughs> but when, when you're feeling better, you can come out of the peace palace. It is not a timeout. Mm -hmm. It is a place to regroup and get back, get yourself back. So yeah. you're ready yeah. to play. Which again, yeah. goes back to the whole thing of teaching them yes. with the love and compassion and yeah. not with the looking down and berating. Right. Right. And I've taken myself to the Peace Palace, yep. you know, because it's a modeling thing. Yes. If yeah. I feel myself getting angry, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm going to stop and I, my Parapro can take over and I'm going to go over there and look in the mirror myself. This is for their benefit. You know, yeah. this is what's just happened. But I don't announce that we have a peace palace. No then, way. Then they all go. They all yeah. need to go. We might as well have class over there. Yeah. You know, so. Right. Right. Yeah. So the biggest things to kind of take away from this is that kindergartners are their own beast, right? They are super young. And really, if you're going to ask them why, they don't know. They don't have that answer yet. They don't understand enough to be able to comprehend if you're going like well why'd you hit him why'd you bump into him why'd you cut him in line i don't know and they truly for the most part don't know it's yeah. our jobs to help fill all of that in with the with the guidance the love compassion and the pro providing the experiences in life to give them those things so all of us here in this panel truly love what we do Yes. We'd be more than happy to, you know, be, have you guys reach out to us after this. We do have a folder that's dropped into the chat box for all this stuff um, of resources we've kind of compiled together because 45 minutes is just not enough time <laughs> to talk about what we do because we love it so much. And there's a lot to talk about. Kindergarten really is a very um, different way of teaching. But what we all kind of decided was if you can teach kindergarten well, you got the rest made. <laughs> yeah. If you yeah. really focus your time and effort on making sure kindergartners can become the students that they need to become, you're now set the complete foundation. Just like how we yes. talked about set, you know, setting that physical foundation first, we are now setting and creating their foundation as students as they move through the years. And so, you'll see that your first graders are a, a whole different way of being if you have set kindergarten up right. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. So again, any questions, we'll make sure to have our contact info in there for you guys. But other than that, it's been a blast getting to chat with you ladies. Yeah. Thanks for yeah, having me. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thanks.